Hello. Um, I am I am a physicist, and we are here to talk about physics because it needs doing. Um, I I am a physicist at University College London. I there are many umbrellas that describe what I do, but I'm definitely still a physicist in spite of all of the others. And I have noticed over the past few years that I think we miss something when we talk about physics. And certainly in this environment, physics has been talked about on many occasions. But the bit of it that I care about hasn't been talked about enough. So we're going to talk about it my way. That's basically what this is all about. Um, and I think... Physics traditionally has had a bit of an image problem. These, this is pretty much the view of physics, and it still is, in spite of Brian and Jim and various other people doing many amazing things. Uh, that picture up there on the top left is it's a very famous image. It's from the Solvay Conference in uh, 1927, I think. And this was a gathering. The, these conferences happened every few years. And it was a gathering where, where they were really wrangling with what quantum mechanics was all about and the nature of you know, whether there was a deterministic universe and what it meant not to know where a particle was and whether, whether they're just models or whether they meant something. And there was this big debate. You'll notice um, there's, a, there's a certain uniformity among the, the people in this image. Uh, third from the left is uh, Marie Curie. I keep nearly saying Marie Antoinette, which would be far more interesting. Marie Curie, they let her in, but she's still dressed in black and white like everyone else. Um, but this is, this is a sort of, you know, these are the people that do physics. They're very serious. They contemplate the universe. They um, all look very similar, and they're very stern. And everything they're thinking about is extremely esoteric. Uh, and some examples of that. So the thing up that lot, up there, that is an artist's impression of two black holes in the process of colliding, the gravitational fields around the black holes. And uh, frankly, that's just weird. This stuff here, any of you who've done any particle physics will recognize these are wave equations. They describe some of the things that those people were um, considering and worrying about, uh, but that's just hieroglyphics quite a lot of the time. And then that lot, I am fundamentally, the first time I saw this photograph, all I could think was, I am so glad that I did not have to write the risk assessment for the person who took that photograph, because any laser safety person that walked into a room where that was going on uh, would immediately have a heart attack and drop dead. So this is basically the traditional image of physics. It's weird, it's far away, it's done by strange people, and it's got nothing to do with anything that actually matters in everyday life, even though it's very significant if you are concerned about the eventual heat death of the universe, for example. Um, but I'm a physicist, and I don't do that, I do this. Uh, this is the boundary between the atmosphere and the ocean. The reason it's it could be a black and white image, it isn't, but the reason it looks like a black and white image is because out in the North Atlantic, um, when you haven't seen land for four weeks, or six weeks sometimes in my case, uh, everything is rather grey, and so it really is grey. But the atmosphere is massive, the ocean is massive, there's this layer, this funny shape where they join together that's continually changing, and sometimes it looks like this, and sometimes it looks like this, and those... Um, White caps are what I study, the bubbles underneath the breaking waves. Uh, and sometimes it looks like this, and sometimes it looks like that. And this is physics, right? The way that you describe this world, this is physics. Um, and this is the stuff I do, and I use the physics I did that I studied during my degrees. Um, but it's the bit of physics that I really think matters, right? When I was... Um, a few years ago, I made a documentary on bubbles, because the BBC, just once in a while, lets you make a documentary on what you really, really care about. You only get one shot at it. So um, the, during the filming of the bubbles thing, we wanted to uh, show some breaking waves at the beach, but it was BBC4 and there was no money. So instead of going somewhere where there's a pretty beach, where it was warm, we went to Cornwall, where there was a pretty beach, and it was really cold. And at some point, I was jumping up and down, fidgeting, because I was cold. Um, and the director, and I only realized afterwards that he was probably doing this to keep me out of the way. He said, you go over there, Helen. We're going to take some pretty shots of something here. You go and sit on that rock. And um, I want you to think about the thing that... The, the thing, about, the thing that makes physics cool for you, the reason that you really care about physics as a subject... Um, 
So I toddled off and sat on the rock, and it was warmer, so that was all right. And I, for the, fir the first time, I, this was the first time I consciously thought that the thing that is most sort of fantastic about physics is that it's all about patterns. So I thought that, and that was very good. And then I realized the consequences of this thought, right? Which is that, well, I'll get there in a minute. Let's look at this pattern. So um, this is an example of a pattern in physics, right? There are things which are, so all these things, cake, the internal combustion engine, hot air balloons, catabatic winds from Antarctica, and popcorn, completely different phenomena. But if you have one little bit of physics, and I promise this is the only equation uh, anywhere in this present, it's quite a nice equation, right? That's it's like a little sentence, it's very cute. Even if you don't like equations, that's quite a nice one. So um, the, the thing, what it says it, in, in maths language is that there is a relationship between the pressure and the volume and the temperature of a fixed mass of gas. And um, you have to try quite, this, and this is all, it's not quite universal, but you have to try pretty hard for this not to be applicable. Um, and that one little pattern, that is at the heart of all of the, the physics that controls those situations, basically. So one little pattern, and you get everything from cake to catabatic winds. So that's the sort of thing, that's what I think is cool about physics, that um, you you basically learn a pattern, and then you just keep applying it in lots of different cases. And then, sitting on my rock on this cold Cornish beach, I realized the consequence of that thought. Don't tell anyone this, but it turns out that this must mean that physicists are fundamentally really lazy. Shh. Because instead of being like the biologists and learning loads and loads of facts about everything, have you seen how many frogs there are in the world, right? What we do is we learn a small number of patterns and we apply them again and again and again. Then people think we're clever. It's brilliant. Um, but these patterns are, all, you know, they're universally applicable. They become tools that you bring with you. And that's the cool bit about physics. It means that once you've learned the tool set, you can keep exploring based on that framework. And um, you know more or less what's going on, but you can apply those tools in lots of different ways. So that's the interesting bit. It's the fact that, because I was never very good, I, when I was a kid, um, I went through a dinosaur phase uh, when I was about seven or eight. And the problem, the dinosaur phase lasted approximately a year and a half, right up until the moment when my aunt and uncle, I think it was, bought me a great big book on dinosaurs for my birthday, and then I was like, okay, I'm done with dinosaurs. But the reason was that back then, it's a bit different now, and I'm not that old, um, what you did if you were keen on dinosaurs is that you learned all the names of dinosaurs and then you learned when they lived and then you stopped, right? You, you learned stuff and you couldn't do anything with it. You couldn't work anything out. And I found that very frustrating. But with all these patterns, you can keep working things out. So that was the fun bit. Um, so going back to that image of uh, physics and where the cake fits into it, because it's a very important question. Um, so this, these are, there's, there's only one equation and there are two graphs, but they've both got the same axes, so it's all right. Um, so time down here, and this is logarithmic scales. This is actually, the pro the, I'm not going to show the numbers, but they are proper numbers. Uh, everything's in its right place in this graph. So cosmology is the physics associated with very large, very slow things. Uh, so that's up one end of the physics, the general view of physics. Um, and down the other end, there's quantum mechanics, which is things that are extremely small and extremely fast. So that's the sort of picture we have of what physics is as a discipline. It's up there or it's down there. The problem with that is that, um, there's some numbers on this one, there's a lot of things that get missed out, and here some of them are. You've got clouds and volcanoes and coffee stains and toast and windmills and clarinets and uh, Saturn and bubbles. And all of this is physics, but it's not included in that picture of what physics is. So if we put them on the same plot, from da down there, so we've got 10 to the minus 10, over there, 10 to the minus 20. So we've got 30 orders of magnitude, right? But where I've placed these on this uh, plot, that's basically where they start. You know, they go up that way and then down this way. So the gap in the middle, we've got a lot of zeros. There's a lot of space for stuff to happen in that gap. The physical laws that matter in this middle bit uh, are Newton's laws of motion, thermodynamics, um, 
sort of the rotational dynamics, for example, what viscosity and surface tension do. So these are the patterns that explain this middle bit of the world. But just because we know the basic pattern doesn't mean physics has stopped, because now the research frontier here in the middle is what do you do when all of those things work together? You can have quite complex situations. You start to build up complicated, interesting things like human beings that you can study with physics. And we are still doing this. Um, and so this is a current frontier in research physics that nobody talks about. And just to, um, in case you don't believe me, these are three things which are current topics of research. And we don't understand any of these things fully. Uh, and yet, you don't need to go to CERN to see them. So the honey thing, um, so it's, I, you know, I, don't, I still don't know what that stick's called. I went, I gave a talk, I showed this at a talk a little while ago and uh, talked about what I'm about to say. And um, a woman came up to me afterwards, she's very lovely, and she sort of opened her jacket in a, you know, and brought out one of those sticks. And she said, I got back from Morocco this morning and I bought this while I was there and I, didn't, I don't really know what to do with it, so I thought you'd like to have it. So I've got one now and I still don't know what it's called. Anyway, so with the honey thing, right, honey at the top's quite straightforward, it's on the uh, stick, uh, and honey at the bottom is quite straightforward, it's in a puddle. The bit in between is quite interesting, it does that sort of twizzly, twirly thing. And when I was a PhD student uh, at Cambridge in the maths department, um, which was next door, one of my friends genuinely spent his PhD in the maths department at Cambridge studying basically the twizzling process as honey comes off a stick because it's, it's, it's an extremely complex process. It's very hard to predict. Uh, so that's current research. Um, I do the bubbles in the middle, so bubbles fragmenting in turbulence. We can do statistics on this, just about. We can do some bulk properties and averages. There is no current physical model that accounts for everything that is going on in there. We know the basic rules, right? We know how surface tension works and how viscosity works, but how they actually manifest themselves in a fluid, uh, that's difficult, and it's the reason I've got a job. And then this thing here, uh, this egg timer, the interesting bit is the cone at the bottom. And what you'll, know that you'll have noticed that whenever you pour out um, a granular material, so that could be uh, flour or salt or pebbles or something, whatever, um, it'll make a little, it'll sort of uh, pile up in a little pile, and then at some point it won't get any steeper and it'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that angle, so every, every granular material has an angle, which is the maximum steepness of the cone that you can have. Uh, and it depends on exactly what the material is and how rough it is and whether it's wet and all these sort of complicated things. So it depends on, on this little grain, right, whatever your grain is. And, but you cannot give someone a grain um, and have them predict what the, it's called the angle of repose, and have them predict what the angle of repose is, right? There's just, it's all classical physics, it's all Newton's laws, but exactly what the angle is from the, your little thing, that, that's a hard job. So these are very everyday things that you see, and there's still things to learn about them. And much more importantly, they're in our everyday world. Um, and these are the rules of the universe, right? Just because it's not actual, doesn't involve general relativity directly, doesn't mean it's not part of how the universe ticks or a useful description of how the universe ticks. So I've got a, um, a video here of a thing, uh, and one of these eggs is raw, one of them is boiled. So I would like you to watch the video and tell me which is which. So you let, get, them, get them spinning first, and then the exciting bit happens after that. This is how physicists occupy Sunday afternoons. Right, which one is raw? The left. I love the way that half of you point that way. Um, that one. That one is raw. And the reason that it's... And it, what's interesting is that I would guess that um, most of you haven't seen this before, but you, you could work it out just from intuition. Right, so, the re so what's going on here is you set them spinning, so you give them uh, their, their rotating, give them some rotation. And when you put the finger on your top of the solid one, you stop the whole leg. There we go. When you put your finger very gently on the liquid one, you stop the shell, but nothing has stopped the liquid on the inside spinning. Uh, so when you take your finger off, the liquid pushes on the shell and it pushes it round again. Uh, that demonstrates something that a physicist would call the conservation of angular momentum, which basically just says that if something is spinning about an axis, it will stay spinning about that axis unless you do something to stop it or make it go faster, to change it in some way. It will just keep going. Um, and so... 
This is very useful if you're the sort of person that boils eggs and puts them back in the fridge. I'm told these people do exist. I won't ask you to identify yourselves, it's all right. Um, but it demonstrates this physical principle. And it's not, the thing is, once you've learned it with eggs, or remembered it with eggs, um, you apply it in lots of other places. So, as a, a sort of from the sublime to the ridiculous type thing, except it's mostly the other way, this is the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, this thing here is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, because the Hubble Deep Field wasn't enough after a while. And uh, NASA's description of that, uh, that frame is that if you had a straw which was two and a half meters long, and I can't tell you how much, I've just spent the last week in America giving uh, similar talks to this, and having to do everything in feet is really depressing. Um, anyway, so a, a straw, drinking straw, two and a half meters long, which is probably about the bit less than the width of the um, thing here, can't remember what it's called. Um, if you looked through your drinking straw, and the little patch of sky that you see at the end of it, that's that amount of space, right? And there's all this detail, and there's all these fabulous galaxies. We're very familiar with these images. In order to take that image, Hubble had to point at that little bit of the sky for almost 11 and a half days. And it, it did do it in, you know, it stopped and started, which is actually even more of an achievement, because it's got to find this little bit of sky, and then go off and do something else, and then point back at it, right? So you've got this thing which is floating in free space, which basically hasn't touched anything apart from a repair mission for 25 years, and yet it knows where it is, even though it's not touching anything. And the way that it does it is it has something inside it which is sadly not an egg, but works on exactly the same principle. Uh, it's got nine of them. They're gyroscopes. They're spinning. Uh, their spin is fixed. They stay pointed in the same direction because there's nothing to stop them. Uh, and Hubble can orient around them a bit like a three-dimensional compass. So the same principle that lets you tell eggs apart in the fridge also makes possible some of the most advanced technology of our time. And spotting these little patterns um, Understanding what's going on in spotting the patterns is, is rewarding. I mean, it's fun and it's interesting, but it's astonishing. There's this sort of assumption that things like playing with the eggs, that's what the kids do. You know, you sort of keep them quiet in a corner, give them some eggs to play with. Um, there's a few things wrong with that. First of all, uh, there's no reason children should have all the fun. Um, secondly, to these little things are, you know, that's how you learn. Uh, and you shouldn't ever be afraid to learn. And the third thing is that it's really rewarding when you work it out. I did the egg demo at, um, it was a bit of a strange thing that I was doing. It was a, um, a bit like a, a sort of corporate thing in the middle of the day. There were lots of middle managers there dressed up very smartly trying to impress their bosses. I don't know why they let me in. And um, I got, I did the thing, I said what I was going to say, and then I, I showed the egg demonstration at the end. But I was running out of time, so I just sort of said, oh, I was, had some person flapping at me on the front row. Come on, get off. And um, so I said, well, uh, so there it is. If you, if you think you've worked out why it is, tell me afterwards, and I'll tell you whether you're right or wrong. And when I'd finished speaking and the rest of it finished, I had... Middle-aged men literally tugging at my sleeve, saying, is it this, is it this? And I would listen to them, and I said, yes, said, yes, <laughs> right? It doesn't go away. That sense of reward does not go away when you, when you make the connections between these things in life. Um, so, so that's the game, right? You learn a pattern with something familiar in the everyday world, and the same pattern explains how big, important things work. And sometimes, the nice thing about having these tools is that you kind of carry them with you. And you, once you start accumulating them, um, you, they, they sort of keep, they, it's like having interest. They come back with interest. And this, the reason there's blueberries here, apart from the fact I get very excited about blueberries, is that I lived for a while in America. And for the last two years that I was there, I lived in Rhode Island, which is a little state sort of halfway between Boston and New York on the East Coast. And um, it's a lovely little place. It calls itself the Ocean State because it, it has quite a lot of water. With no irony, because the ocean is the biggest thing on the planet, and Rhode Island is the smallest state in the US, and they don't, you know, no one's bothered about that. Also, snail salad is a genuine delicacy there. So glad I'm vegetarian. Anyway, so. One of the things about Rhode Island is that they grow blueberries. Uh, there, there in Massachusetts, uh, they grow a lot of the blueberries for the US. And coming from Manchester, um, 
you know, it's hard to remember now, but it's only a couple of decades ago, and blueberries were quite rare in the UK. And now they're everywhere. And when I got to Rhode Island, I was really excited by the idea of blueberries, because well, they're quite exotic, like blue fruit. That's weird, isn't it? Um, and so I thought when I went back to the UK that I would make jam from blueberries, and then I'd have blue jam. That'd be a brilliant thing to take back home. So. I, and it was, it was just a month or so before I, before I moved back to the UK, and I went blueberry picking, which turns out in America is suspiciously like cheating. You know when you go fruit picking in the UK, and you basically have to suffer for it. You either have to knacker your back, like bending down, you know, kneeling down picking strawberries, or you have to scratch your arms to pieces on raspberry cake. You've got to, this is Britain, you've got to suffer for it. Not, not in America. The way you go blueberry picking is like this. You get a sort of um, cloth thing. Blueberry bushes are about this high, sort of like giant lollipops covered in blueberries. And what you do is you get your cloth thing and you sort of waft along the line. And gallons, because it's America, gallons of blueberries fall out into your cloth and then you have blueberries. So I did that and then I took them back to the kitchen where I was living and started to make jam. So you put these things in the pan and you let it all boil up. And I waited for this beautiful blue jam to emerge that I was very excited about. Uh, and that is not what happened. What happened was this, which is very clearly bright fuchsia pink, which was wrong. I wanted blue jam. That was the whole point. So I took it home and told everyone it was blackberry jam. And, and there matters rested for six months. And then uh, six months later, when I was back in the UK, a friend who is a history, uh, director of history documentaries, had uh, called me up and he said, I've got this, I've got this question, Helen. I, he was making a program on um, wise women, on witches, from the 16th and 17th centuries in the UK. And these were women that were, you know, they were the midwives and they helped out when people were ill and they sort of sorted out people who were bewitched, whatever that meant. You know, they did all those little jobs. And they wrote down what they were doing. And he said, there's this odd thing that these, there's these things that they write that are sort of systematic, they keep popping up. Um, so could you have a look at them and see whether there's anything, you know, obviously they're not actually testing for witchcraft, but is there something that, um, is there some other bit of science that explains why these same things keep coming up? So um, the first thing on the list was that if you took, there was a lot about urine in these things. If you took someone's urine uh, and you boiled it first thing in the morning, you took and you boiled it and it went through all the colors of the rainbow, then they were bewitched. I'd think I was bewitched if you boiled. <laughs> anyway, so I um, had a bit of a look around and uh, it turns out that with um, some copper sulfate and a few other things, like if you're a witch, copper sulfate is the best thing going, right? That's definitely blue. So with copper sulfate and a few of the other things that you find in the dyeing industry at the time, it turns out you could quite easily make something called, that the Victorians later called Benedict's reagent. And, um, Benedict's reagent is a test for reducing sugars. And what happens is if you put it with a reducing sugar, it starts off blue because it's copper sulfate based on that. And um, as you boil it, it reduces, uh, so it oxidizes. So it goes from green to yellow to orange to red. So it does go through all the colors of the rainbow. So I can't prove it, but I think that these wise women had invented Benedict's reagent. Um, and and they, what they were actually testing for is a reducing sugar. So where would, where would a wise woman in the 17th century find a reducing sugar? Um, in someone's urine, right? It turns out that there is a way a human can get glucose in their urine, and it's if you're diabetic. So I can't prove it, but it's possible that this description was actually testing for early diabetes. So that was all quite interesting. And then uh, we had to film it. And uh, so I went along to help and there were, you know, I turned up and um, the presenter of the program was Tony Robinson, and I'd never met him before. And um, so I had all these things to do the experiment and some glucose to spike things with. And uh, he walked in, and he walked up to me like this, holding something out. And what it was, was an innocent drinks bottle full of his own wee. And he put it down in front of me and he walked off. Well, I'm, you know, I'm a scientist, I did the experiment, I spiked it with some glucose and it went through all the colors of the rainbow, so that was all fine. 
It's not, don't ever introduce yourself to someone like that. Um, what was worse, what was worse is that because I am actually a good scientist, um, I had tested it on my own urine beforehand. And it was when I was living in Southampton, and I lived um, halfway, sort of along the route. It was Freshers' Week, and I, I lived on the route between where the students' accommodation was and where the um, pub, the nearest pub was. And so I was in this flat, sort of over the students coming and going, partying. And I tell you what, when it's a Wednesday night and you are sitting at home listening to the party outside in your early 30s while boiling your own wee, <laughs> it's time to question your life choices. <laughs> anyway, so, so that, was, that, was, that, was those, that was that set of colours. Um, and then one of the other things that, he, that my friend uh, said is that there's this thing where they say, um, if you put tincture of verbena, and verbena are the sort of colourful flowers you see around quite a lot in the summer. Um, if you put tincture of verbena on someone's skin and it changes colour, then they are bewitched. Um, so I made tincture of verbena, which was hard. It's hard to find verbena in January, but I'm quite persistent. And uh, you get this kind of coloured liquid. And I discovered that I could make it change colour. Um, uh, I, only after I'd been running, but it, it started off purplish and I could make it go blue uh, because my sweat would change the colour. And the reason that it does that is that um, and the petals of verbena have these bright, vibrant colours because they contain chemicals, a class of chemicals called anthocyanins, which cause a lot, but not all, of the pigments we see in uh, plants, basically fruit and vegetables and things like that. And um, these anthocyanins turn out to be pH indicators. So someone's sweat can have a different pH depending on what's going on, what they're eating, what they've been doing. So it's possible that these, these wise women were testing for pH using this tincture of verbena. That was all very cool. Fortunately, it didn't involve any wee. Um, and then I remembered the blueberries. Because when you make blueberry jam, the things that go in the pan are blueberries and water and sugar and lemon juice. So the reason that the blueberry jam came out pink is that the entire thing was basically a litmus test for the acidity of the lemon juice. And if anyone ever gives you blueberry jam which is blue, they have cheated. Uh, so the point is that there was this odd observation, and then six months later, something that made the pieces click together. So that's what it's like, right? That, this habit of being a scientist, as I'm sure many of you are, it's about you sort of collect these little patterns and you build up the framework and you, you have what you learn in books, but then you see the bits that click into place in your everyday life and you can work it out for yourself. So that's, that's nice. Then it becomes important because some of these patterns, these physical laws, also explain big important stuff that citizens need to know about, engineers need to know about. This, so we've got another little video here. Uh, so th there's no reason that they're green. Um, what you're going to see is me just kind of shake the glass from side to side. You've seen people do that many times. Uh, the game with this is to look at the rate of sloshing. So uh, it's the big one first. So you tilt it and it kind of sloshes and that's all right. And then the little one sloshes really, really, really quickly. So you'll see, you'll see the, the magic hand come in again. Um, so there's a sort of lesson here which will look familiar, which is that the wider your container, the slower the sloshing rate. So it does depend on the height and a few other things, but the, the radius is basically the strongest dependence. Uh, and you can imagine up that end, if you put water in a bath in a really big container and you let it slosh from side to side, it goes quite slowly. So the observation is that um, if you disturb liquid in a container, it will slosh. And the sloshing rate depends on the radius. And the larger the radius, the slower the sloshing rate. So that's all very nice. Uh, it turns out that this is the reason that I spill my tea at UCL almost every day on my way back from the tea room. So well, my, my office is down one end of a corridor, and the tea room is up the other end. And every day, uh, I've got quite a big um, tea mug, which is about the size of the, the diameter of the uh, beer glass. I've just realized that makes it sound like I drink beer at work, but I don't. Uh, so, uh, so I fill I fill my mug with tea, and then I walk at race pace back to my office because I never do anything uh, at a sedate pace at work, or in, really in any other time in my life. And um, every day, what happens is that the sloshing builds up, and I basically spill it. And the reason for that is that 
when I'm walking, as I'm carrying my mug, it's getting a little push, sort of periodically, at a fixed frequency, as I'm walking. And it just so happens that my walking speed is almost exactly the sloshing rate of the mug that I have. And the reason that is important is that anything, any object that... So things oscillate in lots of different ways, but they'll have a natural frequency, which is a sort of natural sloshing rate in this case. Um, and if you push them at their natural sloshing rate, the oscillations will build up higher and higher and higher. If you push them much more quickly, nothing very much happens. If you push them very slowly, the whole thing just moves, nothing very much happens. If you get that rate right, you drive an oscillation very, very high, uh, which is resonance. That's all resonance is, that, um, this matching of the frequencies. So basically, I make my T resonate every morning and I spell it. Now, there are a few things I could do about this. I could slow down, not an option. I could drink coffee out, of, I could start drinking espresso out of a really tiny cup because even I can't walk fast enough to slosh at that rate. Um, but I'm not really a coffee drinker. I'd buy it to do experiments on because I quite like the smell, but I don't really drink it. Um, I could drink tea out of a bucket, but I'm not a horse. I could um, start drinking uh, something with a layer of foam on top, so hot chocolate perhaps with cream. Uh, I can't imagine what would happen if I got out squirted cream in the department tea room, but anyway. Um, because it, you'll notice that if you have a cappuccino, it's really obvious, that the foam dampens down the oscillations, so they'll, the amplitude will be much lower, and so which is a reason that beer in pubs does not get spilt nearly as often as it should, because the layer of foam on the top, uh, if you've got beer with a head, uh, will dampen down the oscillations so, that you, so it's not spilled. Um, so, you know, so spilling tea, fine, resonance. This is the trivial application. And then you get to the same bit of physics that explains something far more important, something that really does matter for people's lives. In 1985, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, just off the coast of Mexico, there was a huge earthquake. And Mexico City, which was a little way away, uh, but which definitely felt the shaking, suffered a huge amount of damage. Lots of buildings collapsed, people died. There was a huge amount of economic damage. And after the earthquake, the Army Corps, the American Army Corps of Engineers went along to look at the damage and to see what they could learn about from the way that the city had been built uh, and whether they could prevent something like that happening again. And what they noticed was that um, buildings below five stories high, and there were lots of them, were basically fine. Buildings above 20 stories high, and there were lots of them, basically fine. The things that fell over, the buildings that fell over, were the ones between 5 and 20 storeys, which is a bit weird. And then they looked at the actual earthquake records, the seismometer records um, from the quake. And the geology of Mexico City is, is quite unusual. It sits uh, in a sort of big mountain bowl, and then the bottom of the bowl is filled with sediment, and the city sits on top of the sediment. It's one of the reasons it gets the pollution is so bad, because it's trapped. And um, it turns out that this, this sediment did something quite weird. So the earthquake shaking signal uh, was quite complicated, but the particular type of sediment and its depth and all that kind of thing filtered out some of those frequencies and amplified or um, uh, focused others. So that basically at the city itself, there was it's very unusual, but there was almost a perfect sine wave oscillation at a single frequency. And I'm sure you're ahead of me here. It happened to be the frequency at which a building between five and 20 stories high might oscillate. So all buildings will sway a little bit. You've probably felt them do it if you're uh, somewhere, somewhere tall. Uh, and the taller the building, the slower the swaying. And as it gets smaller, it runs more quickly. So what they worked out was that the reason for most of the damage was resonance that the matching of the frequencies had caused the damage. So that's one thing for an engineer to know. So you can, you can do, deal with that in two ways. You can say either, uh, well, we're just not going to build any 10-story buildings ever again, at least not in Mexico City. Or you can get clever and use the other tools of the way the world works to try and fix the problem. And there are a few different ways of fixing it, but this is my favorite by a long way. If you don't like tall buildings, this is not the building for you. It's the Taipei 101. It was, for a while, the tallest building in the world until the next tallest building in the world came along. Uh, you will notice everything around it is quite low to the ground because it is very close to uh, earthquake zones. Not somewhere. If you're, nerv yeah, if you're nervous about tall buildings and shaking, don't go there. But to help fix the problem of the shaking building, to help reduce the shaking, there is something inside that building, about three 
sort of chunks down from the top. The architects put something quite spectacular, and it is this. And just to give you a sense of scale here, those are people. Each of these kind of lines going out, that's a floor. In the middle of the building, there is a hollow. And in that hollow, there hangs a five-story high steel pendulum, which is painted gold, because why wouldn't you? Obviously, um, and and it's, it, it hangs freely in the building. Um, and what happens when it's when an, an earthquake comes along uh, is that the building sways, but the pendulum gets left behind. And then by the time the building's coming back, the pendulum is going the other way. And so they basically oscillate against each other, and it reduces the amplitude of the building oscillations to about a third of what it would otherwise have been. So once you get the game of how the pattern works, you can then use that to engineer things. Um, and you can see, so it turns out that there are people who have so much confidence in this engineering that when they were in this uh, structure and an earthquake started, they didn't run away screaming like anybody else would have done. They got out their phones and filmed it. And so you can look on YouTube, you can see this, and it takes about 30 seconds for the pendulum to sway across one way and then come back again. There's another couple of ones, um, I think they're just below it. It's called a tune mass damper. It's, it's a really clever physical solution. The game is that once you've got the set of tools, these physical patterns, you can apply them to solve problems. That's the next stage on. And then comes the real fun, because if you uh, are a professional scientist, and I basically became a physicist to play with toys. I mean, really, I just like playing with the physical world and working out what I can build. Um, the fun of it comes when you, that my favorite day of any experiment is the day I get to walk into my lab, which is full of all kinds of interesting things, and I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know I want to measure this thing. And I've got all of these tools, to, and I've got to work out how to put them together to measure things. That's the fun bit, right? Um, and it, what is love, this is where the real creativity in science comes in. It's how do you use these tools, these limitations, to get something interesting done? Now, the reason there's a picture of a, this is a diamond. It's actually, it's a natural diamond. They usually don't come like that. But this one, this one came out of the rock uh, very beautifully. And the rock it's in is called kimberlite, which is where you find a, a lot, a high proportion of all the natural diamonds in the world. It comes out of the tubes of volcanoes. Um, and they, the reason there's a picture of a diamond is that I have a favorite example of lateral thinking in physics. Um, and it's... it came from a friend of mine who was in my PhD. So my PhD lab... Um, was uh, a lab for shock and explosives physics. And I did the explosives, and he was doing the shock. And his name was Jeff, but he was a Kiwi, so he got called Jif. And Jif's job, his PhD, was looking at shock going through diamond. Because if you want to mine diamond, the first thing is you have to break up the rock. And so blast mining is the most common way of doing that. But if you're blast mining something with extremely precious stones in the middle, you've got to be careful because you, you, don't, you want to break up the kimberlite, that's fine. You don't want to break up your highly expensive diamonds. So Jeff was studying um, shock going through diamond. And the way that we did that, or he did that, is that in the lab, there was a gas gun. And what that basically means is that there's a tube about that big around down horizontal tube, five meters long. And down this end of it, there were massive helium reserves, high pressure. And then you put a projectile here, because it's easier, the diamond was down this end, and uh, it's easier to keep the diamond in place so you can point all your cameras at it, and then the thing, the projectile comes down and hits it, and then you get your shock, and you know where everything is. And then this thing could fire the projectile, which was a very solid lump of polymer and metal at up to two kilometers per second. It's not, you know, you want to be a bit careful around that. And it was pointed directly at the center of Cambridge. And uh, so to prevent every experiment becoming, you know, some sort of drilling system just to go through all the old buildings, the thing, there was an enormous thing here, which was a, a helpfully called the catcher chamber, which was a great big steel chamber hanging on chains from the ceiling. And the idea was that, and it was full of rags, and the projectile and the thing would disappear off into the um, container, set the rags on fire, uh, and that would sort of take, you know, that would, it would sway and that would absorb enough momentum to, you know, Cambridge was safe. And uh, this whole thing, by the way, was known as the plate impact facility, which wasn't interesting by itself, except that it was run by a Greek, but he was a very angry Greek, so I never dared um, 
ask him whether he was entertained by that. But it was, anyway. So Jeff had this problem. And the problem was that he could do this and take photographs and do all the signs, and that was all cool. Um, so he could see the diamonds breaking up, but he never got to uh, get the bits because the whole thing just disappeared off into the rags and the mess in the catcher chamber. There's some kind of fireball, and all you got left basically was soot and bits of, you know, it was no good for science what was left behind. So Jeff spent a while trying to work out what he could put there instead of the rags that would do the job of sort of stopping everything clanging around too much and bouncing off the walls like pinball, but wouldn't, you know, that he could somehow get his bits of diamond back from. And I will never forget the day that he, I can see him walking into the door of our lab with these two Sainsbury's bags full of strawberry jelly. He bought out Sainsbury's supply of strawberry jelly. Uh, and he was, you know, a proper scientist. So he spent two days trying to work out how, what the ratio of boiling water to jelly was to do what he wanted to do. And then he cleaned out the catcher chamber and uh, put some jelly in there instead at the end, thinking that, you know, he could sieve the jelly and uh, then he'd get his diamond back, and that was all fine. So he, you know, cleaned this all up, set it up, diamond here, evacuated this, helium up here. And... Uh, it was always very funny when occasionally people came to sort of record this device in action. And uh, because it was firing into a vacuum, it was completely silent until the thing hit the clang at the back of the catcher chamber. Um, and it was really entertaining to us that whenever telly people came along, they'd put this kind of explosion noise onto it. It was completely unphysical. Anyway, so jelly's down there, diamond's there, projectile is here. And uh, so he closed the whole thing up to test this out releases the helium, the projectile comes down the barrel, it hits the diamond two kilometers per second, smashes it to pieces and the whole lot disappears off into the jelly and the catcher chamber. Now, what no one had told him, what he hadn't thought to look up, was that when you put it under pressure, jelly liquefies. <laughs> so the entire vat of strawberry jelly instantly liquefied, splattered out sideways and re-solidified. Uh, he never got his diamond back. He spent three days cleaning up. <laughs> but I love Jeff for doing this, because had he succeeded, that would have been the greatest new advance in diamond-catching technology, right? He did what was actually a really sensible thing to do. He took a physical problem, he found a physical solution, and then he tried it out. And it doesn't always work, right? But you always learn something from it, even if it's that strawberry jelly is not the solution to every problem. But there's this, this is the fun bit, right? You take the laws, but you still don't know quite how they're going to manifest themselves. So then you get to try things out. And that's the, that's the real fun bit for me of being an experimental physicist. It's the poke it and see what happens. Now, you don't need an expensive lab and a catcher chamber or anything like CERN in order to play with the world and experiment. And... This guy here. Now, you may know the Ig Nobel Prizes. Uh, I'm sure you do. They are prizes for science that makes you laugh and then makes you think. And Donald Unger won the 2009 Ig Nobel Prize. And the reason he won it is that when he was six or seven years old, he, his grandmother caught him um, clicking, don't do that. If I, if I tell this t story in high school students, right, they all start doing this. Like, no, I heard you, don't do it. Um, they, see, his grandmother found him clicking his knuckles. You know that thing where people, some people, I can't do it and I really don't want to try. Pull on their knuckles and you hear this little crack and that's bubbles. Anyway, so there's this clicking noise, right? And his grandmother caught him doing that. And she said, don't do that. Because if you do that, when you get old, you will have arthritis. But this awkward sod wasn't taking her word for it. So for the next 60 years, he clicked the knuckles on his right hand and not on his left. <laughs> and at the end of 60 years, he didn't have arthritis in either hand, and they wrote a scientific paper on it. Now, it's an extreme way of testing things out, but you have to give him credit for, first of all, working out that he could test it, that sort of medical testing gen generally not recommended. He could have ended up in arthritis with one or both hands. Um, but the point is, quite a lot of the way we see th these physical laws in the world, it starts when we notice something. And someone says something, or there's some, you know, um, you've heard something, and it doesn't quite fit, and you can't quite work out why these two things you've heard or seen don't quite seem to fit together. And you can 
pl play with that for yourself. And it, it's important for several reasons. It's important because you might as well have the fun. That's important. But also, that's the process of science. It's applying critical thinking to problems and testing out our hypothesis, trying to prove yourself wrong and learning as you go. Uh, and if you do it in the everyday world, you also learn things which are useful for life. Um, so that's all well and good, right? We can learn these patterns, these laws, uh, these basic physical patterns. So thermodynamics, spin, viscosity, surface tension, how time works, how things work at uh, different size scales. There's, there's a set of things that you can, you know, a good starting points. And then you get to the really complicated bit, the sort of the, f the slight flaw in this plan, except it isn't, which is that um, the world is quite a complicated place at our scale. The reason there's a television up there is that my grandfather was one of the first uh, television engineers. He, he trained as a mechanical engineer during the Second World War. And when that finished, he was snapped up by EMI to work on early TVs because this is when they, they were great big bulky things um, that were very fiddly and so that, you know you needed they kept going wrong and they needed people to sort of tend to them. So he did that job. Uh, and electricity and electronics then was sort of full of things that you could see and understand. So there were valves and you know bits of copper wire and things went bang and you know there was a smell if it all went wrong and it was sort of visceral, right? You knew something was going on. Um, my mum, this is not a picture of her, this is just a picture from her company at the time. She worked for Ferranti as a computer programmer before I was born. And she, um, right back when she started, she did actually program in zeros and ones. And she hates me telling people that because she thinks it makes her sound old. I think it makes her sound really cool, so I keep telling people. Um, but the point is that in the, early, the time of early computers, you could just about, you know, following on from that, she used that sort of, um, if any of you ever been to Bletchley Park, seen the computing museum, there's the strips of tape with holes in them, right? That was a how you stored computer code. So she was familiar with all of that. So you could sort of see what was going on, right? even if you couldn't quite touch it. And then my lab looks like this, basically. And I couldn't tell you, you know, I might know some of the principles that help some of those things work, but I, I can't take my laptop apart and put it back together again, and I'm not gonna try. So the question then is, so we know the simple laws, that's all fine. But then what we're faced with in everyday life increasingly is complexity. So there's a couple of things. And the first one is that Fundamentally, these things still obey the basic laws, right? They still obey conservation of energy, even if they do it in a very complicated way. Even if you can't follow the details, understanding the principle is very useful. Um, and we mustn't be afraid of that. The next thing is that technology now and marketing people, I guess, are trying, you know, the consequence of it is that they take, they're starting to take the physical world away from us. We still live in bodies that are about this size. We sit on chairs that are about this big. You know, we still eat toast that is about this size. Uh, we still have tea mugs that are about this big. But the world is full of people saying, it's all very complicated. You don't need to worry about how it works. We'll just provide a solution, and which is great. But it means that we're slight, and there's this amazing thing that we're slightly in danger of losing touch with the physical world, even though we can Google everything um, and look things up in a way that's never been possible. The frontiers of science are not inaccessible, which they have been for most of human history. They're just incomprehensible when you get there. Um, so I think it's really important that we retain a physical understanding of the world, precisely because the same rules do still apply. It's just that they manifest in more complicated ways. Arthur C. Clarke once said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and we've definitely got to the stage of magic. Um, but it doesn't mean we understand nothing. And I think retaining a physical connection to the framework of how the world works is really important, because if you don't have it, you become helpless. Uh, and as soon as you become helpless, you know, you're stuck, you're reliant on other people. But if you understand, if you're familiar, if you're confident enough to experiment, um, then you've, you've got somewhere, you, you've got a way to move forward. And it's also important because in a world with increasingly complicated systems, we are the scientific predictions that come from the research frontiers, you know, into weather uh, and then how your body works and the, the, how these complicated physical systems play out we're increasingly asked to trust complicated predictions. It used to be the case that, you know, if a scientist was giving an explanation, you could pretty much say A causes B causes C, and then there you are, you, we've stopped. Now what happens is that, yes, it's, 
we, can, we understand a lot about how a system works quite often, but you can't honestly convey it in two sentences. Um, there's all these separate things. So this one. So this is a uh, horizon that John Hammond and I did uh, a couple of years ago about, there, was, there were a few winters, a couple of winters, which were, or well, three that were unusual. There were two that were really wet and one that was really cold. And uh, the BBC said it'd be great to make a programme about, you know, what's, what's happened with the weather on, on those, in those years. And if they had understood how complicated the answer was, they would never have asked the question. <laughs> so we didn't tell them. Uh, and we got to making the programme. And, and the answer is that, you know, it's complicated. There's these overlapping patterns, there's things like El Nino and the polar vortex is doing things and something called the quasi-biennial oscillation and then the speed of the jet stream. And um, scientists understand a lot about how the weather and climate system works. And we're beginning to understand quite well those patterns. And it's possible to look back and say, well, you know, these patterns lined up in this way and that gave us a cold winter. And we can maybe make some predictions, we're not quite sure, but we, we've got an understanding of the physical system. Um, but the problem is it's not, it sounds a lot like we don't know. And there's a big difference between not knowing everything and knowing nothing. And so systems are becoming increasingly complex. And if we want to trust, you know, these complicated things, which are the outcome of thousands of hours of work by thousands of scientists and are based on solid science, I think society at least needs to be confident with the methods that it took to get there. And the methods basically start with, you know, why, which egg is which? It's that sort of thing. You have to have confidence with the, the process of finding things out and be able, confident enough to play with it for yourself. And then you can make judgments about which bit of the internet might have something to say about physical reality and which bits just don't at all. There was a wonderful website I found. I uh, did a um, series on colour a couple of years ago and I was re researching ultraviolet cameras. And there's this amazing website which was fascinating. Um, so it was all about... UV cameras and how you could adapt um, a Canon 5D to, to, to make you know, UV pictures. And it was all fine, all technical detail. This is quite interesting, this is quite interesting. And then right at the bottom of all this very technical detail about UV cameras, it had this one line which was, uh, and this, this, is, this camera, this setup is particularly good for detecting uh, ghosts of type 5A. <laughs> Which is a problem, right? Because everything else sounded quite, uh, quite sensible up to that point. Until Anyway, the point is that whenever you get information, there can be clues that suggest that maybe, you know, maybe you maybe shouldn't trust that information as much as you should trust other information. And you need a framework. Even in a complicated situation, you need a framework. All this stuff about patterns and not being helpless, it's not about knowing the answer. It's about being able to ask the right question. The right question in this case being, do I believe someone who thinks that ghosts are real? Uh, and you might, but you just want to wait your, you know, wait your um, sort of, you know, their credibility by, by what you think about the answer. So, um, I, yes, when I was a uh, second year undergraduate studying physics, I, I, so I come from the north of England, obviously. I'm not the same person as Brian Cox, even though we come from quite close together. <laughs> I don't know, it, Manchester has a big, very strong industrial history. Uh, anyway, but uh, so it means that I've got my, my father's Polish, my mother's English, uh, and that means I've got a northern nana on my mother's side, so my mum's mum. And um, nana is very sharp, hasn't had much formal education, but she's with it. And um, I was at her house revising quantum mechanics. And she came along and she looked at the, the hieroglyphics uh, and she said, what's that? And I, I said, it's, it's quantum mechanics, Nana. And I explained, so it was something to do with the uh, model of the atom and Einstein A and B coefficients. And I, you know, talked about, explained this. And she looked very impressed. And then she said, oh, and what can you do when you know that? Don't know, Nana. And I, I think I said something about computers um, because it was all I could think of. But it was a very good question. And uh, it's one that there are lots of reasons for being interested in science, right? There's the curiosity, there's the playing with the toys, 
There's lots of satisfying human reasons for just being finding out how the world works, but there's also one extremely pragmatic reason. And if I this, and I'm going to answer Nana's question really for physics and maybe science as a whole, but definitely for physics. Uh, I think each of us has three life support systems. We've got our own body, we've got our planet, and we've got our civilization, the infrastructure of our civilization. And each of those is a life support system keeping us alive in its own way, and we need all three of them. Um, and one of the reasons, for example, or one way of framing the, issue, the, the importance of climate change is that it's these two systems, the planet and the civilization, butting up against each other. We have to negotiate a boundary because these are both life support systems. Uh, so, something's gone ting. I assume that means I'm running over time. Um, so, the point is that surely, even if you don't care about the fun and the toys, you want to know what's keeping you alive. And the physics, the physical rules that you can demonstrate with eggs and toast and things in your kitchen and things you see around you in everyday life, the things you can learn about in those situations, these are not mundane toys for the children. These are the rules of the universe. And if you want to understand your own life support system, our own life support systems, we need to understand the physical framework on which they're based. Um, so this is the reason that studying these physical laws matters. It's not about toys, it's about keeping ourselves alive. Um, so, because this is sort of a lecture, this homework, um, and this, where, the place this all starts, the curiosity about the world. So, as adults, we've had it kind of beaten out of us, right? There's this um, assumption that, um, you know, you think of questions, you've got all this complicated stuff, you just have to go, oh, that's a bit weird, and then you move on, right? Kids remember to ask the questions, adults have gone. The place this starts is with holding that thought. When you just drift past something, go, oh, I wonder why that does that. Um, stop and hold it, remember it. Even if you're busy now, go back and play with it later, right? Look it up, do something. So with some examples of silly little things around you that you can learn a lot from, um, here are my recommendations to get you started. Uh, put raisins in lemonade, underrated activity. Uh, it's not very good at parties if they're a bit boring because First of all, there's always bar snacks usually that have raisins and there's always lemonade, which has never had a lemon anywhere near it. Only the British would call that lemonade. Um, I've, the last week in the States, having to talk about these things, I kept having to, um, I kept just saying, oh, put raisins in lemonade and they'd look at me like this and go, oh, yeah, fizzy soda, not lemonade. Anyway, so, um, yes, so the putting at a, at a boring party, put raisins in lemonade. It has two consequences, potentially three. The first thing is it, it brings the interesting people to you. Secondly, it shuts the boring people up. And if all else fails, they kick you out and it was a boring party, so you didn't want to be there anyway. Um, watch a coffee spill dry. I know it sounds like watching paint dry, but it's actually quite interesting. Uh, get a time-lapse camera on it if you can. That's well worth doing. Get a spoon and tap a teacup around the room. There's all sorts of stuff you can do with teacups. I am definitely an acquired taste at dinner parties because I can play with teacups for a long time. Get a spoon, tap a teacup around the room. You will hear the sound change. And push some toast off a table. Um, there was a, a friend of mine when I was writing the book who, uh, a friend from badminton who, you know, knows me as an athlete, isn't that interested in science, so uh, was a good person to read it. I gave him one of the draft chapters, and it had um, something about toast falling butter side down in it. And he said he sent me a text message two weeks later, which made me extremely happy. And it said uh, he was working overseas at the time in some in Switzerland or somewhere. And the text message said, "I'm sitting uh, at breakfast in a hotel in Switzerland, and I really want to push toast off the table because I don't believe what you wrote." And that's the good bit, because he doesn't have to. He can push the toast off the table for himself as long as he can face the ensuing embarrassment. And he can look at it, you know, this is, doesn't have to believe me. You can do the experiment for yourself. So that's my view of physics. I think we should all play with it a lot more. After a while, thinking like this becomes a... Um, you, you, you have to write a book just to get it out of you, <laughs> so you can move on with your life. Uh, so I wrote a book, and uh, if you've got any questions, now is the time to ask them. I'm all done. Thank you.